everyone, we are live with you broadcasting from various parts of the Boulder community. My name is Julian and I'm with the Boulder Library and I'm very excited to welcome tonight's guests for our one book, one Boulder community discussion inspired by All We Can Save, an anthology of essays, poems and art contributions from 60 women at the forefront of the climate movement. One of those women is with us here tonight, Dr. Jane Zelikova. Jane is an ecologist and climate advocate. She co-founded 500 Women Scientists, a global grassroots organization with the mission to make science open, inclusive, and accessible. She most recently started a new job as the executive director of the Soil Carbon Solution Center at CSU and joint faculty in the Department of Crop and Soil Science. Congratulations, Jane. Thanks. We are also joined by Boulder City Manager, Nuria rivera Vandermeer and Jamie Harkins with the City of Boulder Climate Initiatives Department. Before becoming the City Manager for Boulder, Nuria served as City Coordinator in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the City of Austin's Deputy Manager in Texas, among many other impressive roles in the private sector too. She is a Puerto Rican native and loves to read. You can check out some of her favorite books at the link that we're gonna share in the chat. Jamie Harkins loves her community, and that's evident as her role in a sustainability coordinator with the city of Boulder for over 11 years, where she works on climate action policies, programs, and projects. She's also the mayor of Lafayette. Her path working on climate started as one of the first presenters with Al Gore's Climate Project, and she's a recent president of Colorado Communities for Climate Action, also known as CC4CA. Thank you all for being here tonight. Before I pass the mics over to you all, I would like to thank the Boulder Library Foundation for their generous support of this program series, as well as 90% uh, of all library events. And with that, I'd like to pass the mic to Dr. Zelikova. Take it away, Jane. Thank you, Julian. And I'm so excited to be here with such an incredible uh, group of um, amazing climate advocates and um, impressive people in general. So today we're gonna have a bit of a conversation, a little, a little bit of a moderated conversation that is really rooted in this book um, that was selected as the one book called All We Can Save. And you can see that it's a well-loved <laughs> book that I go back to and read all the time, um, especially when I'm having a really hard time finding um, Remembering why I work on climate change, this book is kind of my place to go and remember why I do this in the first place and get re-inspired. Um, I'm going to start off today by reading a poem that's in the book called Being Human by Naima Penniman, um, who is a director of, I think a creative director at Soul Fire Farm um, and is an artist, uh, writer, an advocate, um, and a climate champion. So uh, if you're reading along at home, in the hardback, it's page 266, if you're one of those people that has the book next to you. Okay, being human. I wonder if the sun debates dawn some mornings, not wanting to rise out of bed from under the down feather horizon. If the sky grows tired of being everywhere at once, adapting to the mood swings of the weather. If clouds drift off, trying to hold themselves together, make deals with gravity to loiter a little longer. I wonder if rain is scared of falling, if it has trouble letting go, if snowflakes get sick of being perfect all the time, each one trying to be one of a kind. I wonder if stars wish upon themselves before they die, if they need to teach their young how to shine. I wonder if shadows long to, just for once, feel the sun if they get lost in the shuffle, not knowing where they're from. I wonder if sunrise and sunset respect each other, even though they've never met. If volcanoes get stressed, if storms have regrets, if compost believes in life after death. I wonder if breath ever thinks of suicide, if the wind just wants to sit still sometimes and watch the world pass by. If smoke was born knowing how to rise, if rainbows get shy backstage, not sure if their colors match right. I wonder if lightning sets an alarm clock to know when to crack. If rivers ever stop and think of turning back. 
if streams meet the wrong sea and their whole lives run off track. I wonder if the snow wants to be black. If the soil thinks she's too dark, if butterflies want to cover up their marks, if rocks are self-conscious of their weight, if mountains are insecure of their strength, I wonder if waves get discouraged crawling up the sand only to be pulled back again to where they began. If land feels stepped upon, if sand feels insignificant, if trees need to question their lovers to know where they stand, if branches waver at the crossroads, unsure of which way to grow, if the leaves understand they're replaceable, but still dance when the wind blows. I wonder where the moon goes when she's in hiding. I want to find her there and watch the ocean spin from a distance. Listen to her stir in her sleep, effort give way to existence. I love this poem. I have read it like 10 times. I read it three times just today. Um, and I kind of want to start off this conversation by asking folks who are online and also Jamie and Nuria, what this poem kind of brings up for you, uh, what you're thinking about when you hear those words. Um, so if you're participating online, go ahead and uh, put your thoughts in the chat and maybe we can start with Nuria. Sure. Um, you know, it, it's my favorite poem, I think, in the whole book. I just, I loved it. I resonated with it so much. It was um, both to me evoked a sense of wonder and a perspective as we put some of those emotions on ourselves and those insecurities on ourselves and thinking about nature in its glorious state. Um, and then it brought me back to times when, you know, particularly when I'm talking to my son, I have an 11 year old son. Um, and as we have talked, as he has been growing up, those I wonder questions to me seem so imaginative and childlike in the best sense of the word, um, open to possibility, open to thinking about how is everything interconnected? Um, and it brought me to such a kind of almost spiritual place of imagining. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, no, I that resonates so much with me as well. I actually got into the climate, you know, I changed my career and went back to school to start doing climate work. And it was very much based on experience that I feel like this poem is almost describing of out in nature and some just a very spiritual experience that I had. And you're right, I think we need to ask those wonder questions more often. I think we get so um, caught up in our day to day life. And I, I think we could step back and, and start thinking that way more often. And I think it's just such a beautiful poem. It had me in tears. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I what feel like as a scientist, it's uh, one of the things I talk about is anyone who's ever asked that question, I wonder, or had a sense of curiosity about an observation and then wanted to know more is basically doing science. And that's kind of what mm -hmm. science is about. That's kind of what, that's what we're here for is to wonder about the world and try to answer questions. So I loved it so much. Love that. Great. Um, so yeah, one of the great things about this book is it's split into distinct sort of, um, I guess, not chapters, but sections. Um, and so one of the first sections that I want to talk about is the section called Feel. And it really calls upon the readers through different essays to um, bring, have a personal experience or, or kind of invoke the feeling of climate grief and how different people kind of approach thinking about and feeling the impacts of climate change, not just the physical impacts, but also the emotional um, impacts of the world changing so rapidly and in ways that can feel really out of control. Um, so one of the essays that I really loved and wanted to talk about is uh, Mary and S. Hegler's uh, essay called Home is Always Worth It. Again, for folks that are uh, reading along at home, it's in the hard book on, on the hard cover on page 276. And one of the things that Mary writes is that because the thing about warming is that it happens in degrees. That means that every slice of a degree matters. And right now that means everything we do matters. We quite literally don't have time for nihilism. And one of the things that people ask me quite frequently when they find out that I work on climate is how I still have hope in the face of what is now becoming more and more apparent as a climate crisis. 
Um, and Mary writes um, something, she makes an observation about climate scientists that I really feel like resonates in my experience, which is, she writes, meanwhile, the climate community's insistence on hope everlasting begins to sound anything but realistic. At best, it is emotionally stunted. At worst, it's downright sociopathic. She doesn't mince any words. Um, so I guess the question I have for Nuria and Jamie is if not hope, I mean, we can talk about the power of hope, but if not hope, then what do we need to do? What do we need to kind of harness to confront the climate crisis? And maybe Jamie, you could start. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm not ready to give up on hope quite yet, but uh, um, I do think there was a quote in this um, essay that I highlighted like 50 times. Um, and it was that, um, we don't have to be Pollyannish or fatalistic, we can just be human. Um, and it talks about hopelessness versus helplessness. And what if courage leads to action and hope is what comes next. And so that really resonated with me because even within my circles of um, both folks working on the front lines of climate and elected leaders, um, I feel like there's still a lot of room for courage. I feel like um, there's a tension between what we know we need, the bold action we know we need, and like what's politically possible or what is, you know, incrementally will get us a step closer. And so often we will fall into that incrementalness just because it's what's in front of us and it's what we can accomplish. And I'm, I'm seeing this tension play out for me right now in my world. And um, I just think we need to be more courageous and more bold, bolder um, in what we're asking for and, and quite frankly, change what we think is possible. So I'm still hopeful. But there are certainly days where I have to fall back on that that courage piece a little more. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. How about you, Noria? If not hope, then what? Yeah, I I, I too am not um, willing to give up on hope quite yet. But I, you know, I, I tell people as, as they get to know me, and I am new to this community and the non-scientist and non-climate um, technician amongst us. So I come from a very um, I would say a heart space to this work, right? And But I'm also practical. And what I have learned as um, we're all in this journey together is that you have to meet people where they are and that we have to push forward no matter what it is. And for some people that are already in the trenches that are doing amazing things and people are doing amazing things in this community, um, then how do we support that? Because they're going leaps and bounds into this notion, and I really appreciated that first reading of, we've got to do what we can do, right? Um, we have to move forward and do it in different directions and different ways. But the other aspect of that, and I think of that with my family in Puerto Rico for whom perhaps climate change is not native to them, thinking about um, climate efforts and climate conservation and climate mitigation was not something that I grew up with. And I think about conversations I have with an island that has been devastated by the impacts of climate change. And, and I come to that a lot because that is how I have come to really be, um, I hope, not just an ally of the work, but a champion of the work. And I don't know that I would have been here 10 years ago, right? So I really think of it as being practical about what can we do to offset as much as we can? Climate change is here. How do we continue to mitigate and how do we push even harder to get that slice even bigger than we did before. So I I come to it hopefully with a practical hope in my veins. Well, maybe just to continue on that a little bit, um, I would love to hear some examples of things that you've seen Boulder, the city of Boulder, the city of Lafayette do that um, to address climate change, be it community uh, driven efforts or efforts led by government that really give you that like little bit of hope and courage that you need to move forward? Like what are the things that you've seen that have really helped fuel your hope? So I'll say, you know, one of the privileges of being new to a community is that you get to go out and meet a bunch of people and get to do meet and greets with staff that are doing amazing work. Um, and so I came to Boulder in May and the very next month I saw climate change present a whole new paradigm for how to look at um, the next part of our climate action plan. And it was really kind of centered equity. It really was inclusive. 
it really pushed the city to think beyond the city of Boulder and to really reset its targets, which was amazing to me, right? Because we as government always think about what that's going to know that Boulder had met its 2020 renewable energy goals was amazing. And now they're pushing us even further to go out to open space that I think dedicates 40 to 60% of their work to their estimation and see things that I never knew open space was doing. I came here with the beauty of the natural environment in mind and seeing how much is dedicated to agriculture and uh, looking at soil health, which was nothing I had ever really looked at before was amazing seeing how um, farming was happening in Boulder and how they're constantly looking at new ways to both expand local production, which means that, of course, we don't have to travel other distances to bring food in and to bring um, products in. We help the economy. But the thoughtfulness that they're thinking about, how do we continue to measure uh, and soil health so that we can continue to move forward? All of that was astonishing to me as I think about it how much electrification is happening in vehicles and in buses and in a commitment to our fleet. I mean, there are examples for me abound of what Boulder is doing and I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. Yay. Awesome. Well, yeah, we're so glad to have you be a part of it as well. Um, I've probably too many examples to cite, but um, I think, you know, in my, my work, I specifically, right now I'm working on our circular economy strategy and, you know, what comes after zero waste and how do we work on consumption? Because that's a piece that we actually haven't talked about really overtly in the long time Boulder has been doing climate action. Um, and so I, I just remember right before, you know, before COVID, we had a public forum where we took this sort of new approach and new thinking around this idea of, a, of circular materials and that recycling isn't necessarily the answer. And I could not believe A, the turnout we got and B, just how excited people were that their local government was thinking this way about the bigger systems, about how do we, you know, actually solve the root. So much of this, we have to get to the root of the problem. Um, and so I, that was just one example that gave me recently a lot of hope for where we're going in the future. But yeah, I think, while we have certainly, our department has acknowledged we cannot do this alone. I think just um, some of the things Boulder has done in the past being modeled nationally is is so cool and so amazing um, over the years that um, that gives me a lot of hope too. What well, about you, Jane? You what do you think? Oh yeah, I mean, you set me up perfectly um, oh, to talk about the power of, well, first of all, rooting. Um, mm -hmm. Root is the first kind of section in the book. Um, and it's really all about sort of root, rooting our uh, our thinking uh, about climate and kind of like our understanding of and appreciation of beauty of our natural world. And so I wanted to talk about a, um, Adrienne Marie Brown's essay, What is Emergent Strategy? Which is pretty short and also like maybe one of my favorite essays in the book. I've like gone back and read it over and over again. Again, if you're following along, it's on page 37. And she says so many things in this essay that I've underlined repeatedly. Um, and I want to make stickers and t-shirts up. But <laughs> one of the things, um, so she defines mm -hmm. emergence as a the way complex systems and patterns arise out of multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. And as a, an ecologist, this is like speaking to the very core of me. Um, and she gives all kinds of examples like migration of birds and then pr proliferation of dandelions. Um, she also writes something that I love, which is nothing is wasted or a failure. And I remember uh, writing when I was a graduate student here at CU, writing a letter to the city of Boulder who wanted me to cut down the weeds in the front yard of our house. Mm. And I wrote this impassioned letter about how a weed is in the eye of the beholder because I was like, it's just a successful plant. It's doing really <laughs> well. Yeah. Um, anyway, it was a little bit ridiculous, but also kind of this point that like nothing is wasted mm -hmm. or failure really resonated for me. She also writes, oak trees don't send an intention to listen to each other better or agree to hold tight to each other when the next storm comes. Under the earth, always, they reach for each other, they grow, such that their roots are intertwined and create a system of strength that is as resilient on a sunny day as it is in a hurricane. I love that because like the visual of roots intertwining underground and providing strength um, is like so much about community and about community resilience. Um, so I wanted to ask y'all, um, looking at Boulder, the city and county more broadly, 
and the climate impacts that we've already experienced and experienced kind of all the time. Like today is really, feels really smoky here again, and it's been smoky a lot for months. Um, and that's, you know, in part due to climate change. So I wanted to ask if there are some cool examples of collective action already taking place uh, and where you see collective action emerging mm -hmm. in our city and county. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, Jane, as this being like one of the most impactful essays for me as well. And I, I literally was the other day just Googling like emergent strategies in public policy because I was oh. just so Adrienne Marie Brown has a book called Emergent Strategy. Oh, you have it, well, there you, you can go. borrow it or you can just okay. get it. It's awesome. But I, it was just so fascinating because I think, I mean, all my coworkers know I'm a policy nerd at every level. And I think we often think we can like dictate a solution, you know, like that's the purpose of policy. Like let's um, say what should be happening and people will do it and, and we will solve the problem. Um, I think there still is a role for policy, obviously, you know, we talk about it, leveling a playing field, um, incentivizing certain behavior, but this just had me really thinking about like, do we t spend enough time think looking at what happens after policy is made, mm -hmm. revisiting, you know, really, um, doing that learning of, of what, what happens collectively after we take some kind of action and and adjusting for that. I don't think that we are very good at that, collectively speaking, we, not just Boulder. Um, but I do think, you know, when you asked for an example, um, it was hard for of collective action. I mean, one thing that I could think of was a very interesting shift, you know, back in trying to remember the year. Sorry, y'all. I think it was like 2012. What when is we time? Did, what is time? The uh, disposable bag fee, which was a um, the result of a collective action from the community. A bunch of high schoolers uh, started coming to council meetings and demanding action. And we heard them and we, we put that into place. But what was so interesting to me was not that everyone started not wanting to pay a financial fee, but like even when folks forgot their bags, they would they would come out of the stores with their arms full of their things because culturally it became like not cool to like take a plastic bag. And I just thought that that was such an interesting like cultural shift that was like, imp you know, like kickstarted by a policy, but like really took on a life of its own um, among folks just like within social norms. And so I just, I think that's an interesting example, but I I also think we just need to think about this more, and I'm excited to think about it more as we um, figure out where we go from here. Yeah, I am I am one of the people that comes out of the grocery <laughs> store carrying all the things and like all of my yeah. pockets stuffed. Um, yeah. yeah. What about you, Noria? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. My the the thing that came to mind was not an example of Boulder, frankly, because I've I've only been here for such a short time. Although. Um, the the boulder example it made me think of to your point about a imagining that work underground and looking at the root causes was powerful to me although my initial mind went to the power of um social justice and climate action and i thought of a recent example i had heard of how uh, one of our nonprofit partners at centro la Mista, worked together with um, parks and OSMP and said, you know, we appreciate it as we're trying to figure out how to bring more communities of color to appreciate the natural environment, which is not necessarily a place where historically we have been across the nation, not just Boulder, right? Um, mm -hmm. Looking at how do we how do we educate and um, folks on like leave no trace principles and you know, please respect sort of the grasslands and keep on the trail so that we can continue to keep our um, our natural environment um, well, and how much of that was, we get it, but a bunch of words aren't going to do anything for us, right? Like, we're not going to read it. It's not in our language. Mm. It's too much. It's very governmenty. How do we think about that? And they really came together and helped put more visualizations to that. And I love that as a small example that had great impact on um, the city and really changed the way in which we, we, we did that. But I have, you know, I see the power of the collective, which is what I thought that example was. And I was brought to that example of the trees too, thinking about how do we link arms and join together. 
And I have seen that so much in many cities. And Boulder has that collective voice. You hear it all over. The recent air quality uh, website where it talks about, we have heard this from folks, let us build something so that we can talk together about what's happening in our community are some of those examples where it happens because we hear from so many of our partners in our community. So while I may have a, a another example from another city more in mind about that, I'll say that I see it happening all over here as we partner with see you as we we partner with our 39 regional communities that Jamie knows so well, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and our CC for CA, uh, as we partner with, um, and I hear the same conversations from other city managers and staff about how are we going to continue to move forward collectively and with community, because the people that often bear the burden of some of our actions are the people that can least afford that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think there are examples abound. The solar garden that is now in our manufactured home community is, is an amazing example of partnership, I think, um, with people that are impacted by the cost burden of uh, energy costs. Yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, even this book in and of itself is such an example of uh, a collect, like a collective uh, and a, a, a mighty chorus, the way Catherine and Ayana described this book is it's a mighty chorus that all of us individually have a small to medium to large platform, depending. Um, some might say, uh, you know, the advisor to the president has a pretty large platform on climate science, but um, even if our, our individual impact is medium or small, that together we created this mighty chorus of um, ideas, kind of approaches, mm -hmm just even the words that we use and that being put together in a kind of a collection of essays was this amazing opportunity for us to have collective impact. Um, I think just from a personal, like I did not expect this book to blow up the way that it did. I didn't expect it to be a bestseller. We know what a climate book written by women, I could have never imagined. Um, but I think it's because it's a mighty chorus of so many voices and just the amazing job that Ayana and Catherine did in pulling all of it together is such a good example of collective action. And, it, and so much of this book is about equity and about lifting up voices and people who aren't necessarily at the table making decisions, but should be. Mm -hmm. I love that about this book. Um, okay, so uh, to kind of think about the issues of inequities, um, and maybe this is something that I could ask you and folks to put in the chat. Um, the next uh, section is called Reframe. And one of the uh, essays that I really like is from Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who's a climate scientist at Texas A&M. Actually, she just joined the Nature Conservancy, so she's over there now. Um, and it's an essay called How to Talk About Climate mm -hmm. Change. Um, and what she does really well in that essay is that she really links the personal impact and personal story and personal connection with the fact that the most important thing we can do um, as individuals, as climate scientists, as anything that we are doing in our lives is show up and be willing to talk about climate change mm -hmm. with anyone, with person sitting next to you on the plane, with um, a, someone that you're getting coffee from or what, whatever it is that every opportunity to talk about climate change really matters. Um, but we have to root it in something that really matters to us personally. So a question of is, what is that matters to you personally that the climate crisis is affecting and so i'll ask jamie and maria but i also want to ask the audience if you want to put things in the chat yeah what is like the personal thing that really matters to you that you feel like cli the climate crisis is impacting we limited to one i know i was like <laughs> you pick your not your top one just the first one that comes to mind maybe we can keep this short well, I'll I'll say Go ahead. this is super broad, but I'll just say the people, people, people everywhere, because that was, you know, why I got into this work was because of the equity, the inequity of it all and the incredible injustice of it all. And just knowing that this thing that we mostly are driving is going to impact folks around the planet that do not have the means to survive it as, as well as we will just broke me. Um, and that's why. I started writing letters to Al Gore. I heard about this project he was launching. I didn't even know anything about it. I just started sending letters to his office. 
<laughs> I said, I have to, I have to, I want to talk to people about this problem. And um, so this essay, and I've seen Dr. Heho speak, and she's amazing, um, resonated with me because back then I used to go and talk and do the 400 slide slideshow, mostly to faith communities. And it was so amazing because it did resonate with them on such a values place. And, and that was, they were some of the most impactful experiences of my life. Um, and so, yeah, just, just the people, it's, it's a very large answer, but um, the collective global citizenry that um, I care very much about. Yeah. I love that. And I say, I, I don't disagree with it. It, it usually starts for me with people. Um, my purpose for being in public service is mm -hmm. the people, right? A little bit more specific, I'll say that uh, what really turned me around, um, again, I have been uh, an ally for many, many years. I know the importance. I've understood um, the impacts of climate change, even though I don't know the scientific and the technical um, details of what it takes to really address it, but been very supportive of all city efforts as we move that forward. But I will say to you that it took two things to really make me lean into a different way and one was the birth of my son, because now I had some responsibility for the future as that moved forward. Um, but then really importantly, I'll say that Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, my parents are there um, watching my family and my friends and my relatives and the despair that they felt when the entire grid went down. And months later, they were still without electricity. They were still without water on an island, mind you, that has so many resources, solar, wind, mm -hmm. uh, the power of water and, and hydroelectricity, so many resources, and yet had never really had um, the capacity and um, the resources behind it to develop that. Mm -hmm. But it was the heartache of that that really has triggered uh, a, a change in how I approach it and how I want to lean into climate in the future. Um, and, and it's a shame that it took that, but it all takes us. And that was one of the things that was interesting about that passage, that every interaction that you have, every experience with you have, is that opportunity to engage people in deeper levels. And I love her ability to be nimble and to quickly adapt um, and really meet people where they were so that they could then become part of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I love that too. Um, What's your one thing, Jane? I mean, I think the people I it's interesting because I started working on climate change in from such a like scientific curiosity mm -hmm. perspective and very much like I was doing this big climate change experiment for my PhD and simulating uh, a future climate situation and mm -hmm. seeing how these organisms were responding. And it was very much like I was separate from it and I was observing. And I wasn't, I mean, I was emotionally invested in my PhD, but I wasn't emotionally invested in the climate change part of it. I was emotionally invested in the curiosity and I want to answer this question part of it. And I don't think I became fully like emotionally invested until a lot later, until I really started to see the impacts on people. Mm. And still, I, I mean, I feel guilty about it now, but still feeling like, um, I'm so curious about the outcomes from like a science perspective, like we're conducting this global experiment and we're all inside of it, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. And there's like layers and layers to it. So as a scientist, I separated myself emotionally from the work that I was doing. And it wasn't until many years later that I was able to figure out how to bring my emotional, like my full self to the questions I was asking. Mm -hmm. And that actually made me a better scientist. But the training that we get is very much like, leave your emotions at the door, bring yeah. your like logical self. Um, but I think that the emotions and the grief, I really feel a lot of grief around it. It like mm -hmm. upsets me and makes me cry a lot of the time um, because it is so unfair. And one of the things that Dr. Hayhoe writes is, is climate change fair? Absolutely not. The poorest, most vulnerable among us, those that have done the least to contribute to the problem are most affected. The 85 lowest emitting countries in the world who have contributed virtually nothing to the problem will bear 40% of the economic losses and 80% of the resulting deaths from human induced climate change. That is absolutely not fair. I think that's kind of what at this point keeps me working on it, even in the hard times. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so one of the questions I had for y'all is I know that, you know, equity and justice is important to you both and seemingly important to Boulder City, County and Lafayette. I say seemingly because I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, and so one of the questions that I'm really curious about is how is the city of Boulder, Boulder County, Lafayette, thinking about and addressing the already deep inequities that exist in our communities? And we know, you know, Boulder's wealth gap is enormous. People are exceptionally well off and people are very poor and the poor are virtually invisible. Um, and so how, and because we know that climate change makes those inequities worse and amplifies problems we already have, what are the city and county of Boulder doing to address those inequities, especially in the climate impacts space? Yeah. You know, I, I want to jump in here and I want to just add to that and it bridges the other question too, is that certainly we see it in Boulder and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it's so funny as you talk about um, the inequities that exist. I've really come to resonate with another essay in the book about climate migration, because that's what we're seeing, right? Like we're mm -hmm. seeing the impacts of people all across the world fleeing their homes because of lack of food, because it can't grow, because of drought, because of, um, certainly there are other political reasons for it, but we're seeing so much, I think, an increase in in um, sort of what I think one of the essay is called like climate refugees, which mm -hmm. was a fascinating term to think about um, precisely because of the inequity in the world. And, you know, when I, I come to Boulder now, and, and what I appreciate actually is that Boulder, I believe, is leading into, um, the, the inequities it has, the demographics that it has, right? It's it's leaning into, we need to be more inclusive, perhaps because uh, having come in, I've gotten to meet some of our partners in particularly the Latino community at a council member who um, had a little Latina power meet and greet, which was fabulous. And I met some of the folks in community who are doing um, explorando senderos in Boulder, sort of exploring trails in Boulder and introducing young kids to trails in ways that give me hope that they will now perhaps sort of tie that to stewardship of environment and what impact that may have in the future of climate. I've met a young woman who is, is working at CU doing flows, which really goes and um, helps low income communities with uh, sort of water conservation and will come in and do an assessment and will install free of charge sort of what's uh, either aerators or low flow shower heads or whatever it is that 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 particular apartment needs. And then I was learning a little bit about uh, and I mentioned it earlier that manufactured home community and where the city really is installing or installed at the Boulder Reservoir some solar gardens. And that energy savings is being passed on to a community that is virtually invisible in many other cities. And you really see the city leaning into how do we hear that voice? How do we share that? How do we expand and take that cost burden off? So all these little areas where I'm seeing the city sort of lean in and reach out and engage and actively solicit feedback from a smaller percent of our community of color, which doesn't always exist here uh, in larger places, in, in larger numbers that we're perhaps used to seeing in other cities. I, I think it's so hopeful and making sure, and that's where people should hold us accountable for, right? As we center and move forward with a new climate action plan and a systems approach, are we doing what we say? Are we being as inclusive? Are we finding forums and partners from other communities to make sure that we're actually not just doing the right thing by the planet, but really thinking about climate justice in the process. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited to think of a new greener economy and are we passing on employment opportunities and capacity for folks that will be left behind if we don't do this uh, in different ways. So how do we do things differently so that we address it will be exciting. And I'm starting to see some of that already in my new community. So it's thrilling. Awesome. Yes, we. Um, so yes, you. Uh, they did mention I've been at the city a little over eleven years, and so um, I feel like this is such an important question, and it's something that our department is really leaning into right now. Mm -hmm. um, I would say we have talked about equity for a long time. I think asking the hard questions about our work um, is, and adjusting is a newer, purposeful commitment. 
Um, and I want the community to really hear the heartfeltness behind that because it is really, you know, we have worked so hard over the years to put these programs in place and are, you know, recently like, well, who is not accessing them and why? And like, we're actually launching things. Like we are working to get air purifiers in the hands of um, manufactured home community members. But even that, I know that's not something I'm directly working on, but the woman who is was telling me that just talking to those folks, they learn things about why that may or may not work that they would have never thought about. And mm -hmm. I think that that is so important. Um, you know, we are launching a bunch of some new programming around picking up uh, materials and recycling from the manufactured home communities. These folks, we always assume folks are mobile and have a car to go to where we have built these fabulous facilities and that's just not the truth. And so I think we are very, very deliberately like really asking the important question of how we, not, how we truly center equity in this work moving forward. And I'll just say like from my life, separate from the city of Boulder, like that is a very hard Thing to do sometimes just politically because they're not always the folks at your mm -hmm. council meetings being the loudest and wanting certain solutions from you and i think that um as city staff as elected leaders i think it's really important to keep what we are centering in our mind and realize that may not be who is able to come and speak to us in that moment and how do we hear from them um but that it's difficult sometimes it's when you know, it's a lot easier sometimes to listen to the loudest voices that know how to access you, <laughs> know how to get your ear. And I think um, I'm really proud of the work that Boulder is doing to really try and get this right. I will say from a smaller city perspective, it's harder. Uh, there just isn't the staff, there isn't the money, there isn't, you know, a lot of that bandwidth. I think, um, you know, regionally, it's something that we can talk more about how we help um, other communities um, not be left behind in this because it is just a lot more difficult when you lack resources to um, do some of this, but not impossible. And we certainly are starting to bring that lens to every policy decision made. Um, you know, who are we thinking about? Are we really understanding mm -hmm. the impacts? And that, um, it doesn't sound revolutionary, but like it actually is to have, to have that discussion when you're talking about like snow plowing or water rates, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's not climate related. Well, it is all, that is all climate related actually. Um, but that is a pretty radical thing to be bringing up in, you know, in, in that forum. And so I'm really proud of, of that work, but um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say everything is lesson. climate related. Every decision yeah, it is. ultimately is yeah. a climate change impact. Yes, I said or, that and I was like, oh, that's not true at all. Yeah, <laughs> everything is climate, guys, everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, one thing uh, I, I would say as a person who lives in Boulder is sort of the need to relentlessly push our elected officials to actually like put the words into action. Cause I think there are a lot of well-meaning words that are spoken, but that the action is really hard and that the people at those council meetings have a lot of privilege to show up and yell and demand whatever it is they're demanding. And the quiet voices that you don't hear are the ones that probably really need to be heard. So just, I'm happy to hear that there are efforts to, to listen. And I know it doesn't seem revolutionary. We should have been doing this all along. Mm -hmm like asking people what they actually need and then giving them those things, especially for communities we don't hear from mm -hmm. is really That's powerful. Important. Yeah. And it has to um, be the way forward. It's just, it has to be like, there's yeah. no other option. So, well, so speaking of the unseen majority uh, and heard of majority, my, I wrote an essay in the book. And for those of you who are reading along, um, it's called solutions underfoot. I'm trying to see what page it's on. It's somewhere in the 270s, <laughs> 80s maybe. Um, and it's uh, it's an essay that I wrote that's a bit of an ode to soil and microbes and the important roles that they play in helping us modulate and uh, mitigate climate change. So soils hold a lot of carbon already and the way that we treat our soils really matters for climate change both in terms of limiting the, car the carbon we release into the atmosphere and also the opportunities we have for putting some of that carbon back. And so I write, weird to read my own words, but um, <laughs> there's a growing community of farmers and ranchers who are excited to regenerate their land. The agricultural solutions are not new and don't hinge on technological breakthroughs. 
building better soils and drawing down carbon is ready for prime time and can be implemented on millions of acres across the country and the world tomorrow. So one of the things I talk about in the chapter or in the essay is that the things that we need to do to manage our soils better are just thinking differently about how we do agriculture, mm -hmm. um, not plowing as much, planting, pl uh, sort of making sure that the soil is covered most of the year, if not all of the year, keeping kind of roots in the ground as much as we can, and that these are not new solutions and they don't hinge on the invention of some magical technology or silver bullet, that we can do this, we just have to have the will and the incentives to make it so. And that it really relies on this kind of humming engine of invis invisible microbes underground that are literally driving this really important transformation and storing carbon underground. And it also relies on farmers and ranchers, people that we don't always see, but that we rely on every day because we all eat every day and that their jobs are so critical to both feed us and the growing population, but also uh, potentially to help us put carbon back in soils. Um, yeah, so I know that Boulder County is doing a lot in this space and I've had a little bit of an opportunity to work on some of this stuff, um, but I wanted to ask if you could share a bit of what Boulder County is doing in terms of soil friendly, soil carbon sequestering farming. Um, Jamie, maybe you know more yeah. about what we're doing yeah, I can um, give a little taste. I will say I have a coworker who could give an hour long, <laughs> super enthralling presentation about this, but um, I will say um, this is an area of work that we have taken on in the last few years and it's really exciting. And Jane, your ch your chapter is just amazing. And I, mm -hmm. I dove in because I think it's such a magical solution. Like, of course we should be nurturing the natural systems that can help us out of this problem before we pursue these technological advances that we're not quite sure how to get. It's just such a common sense and magical and a solution and I just love it. So um, the past few years we have been doing a soil sequestration pilot project on a piece of land owned by the city where we're testing out I think five or six different uh, treatments from biochar, compost, different tillage methods to see you know what sequesters most carbon. So that is ongoing and very exciting. Um, I know at the same time, we are working with some private and public sector partners uh, to launch Restore Colorado, which um, some of you who eat out in Boulder, if you are at a participating restaurant, may notice a little 1% charge, I think it's 1%, uh, to contribute towards regenerative agriculture. And that money, the first round of grants are actually starting to go out, which is really exciting. And that money is going directly to farmers and ranchers to really implement regenerative um, practices. So that's also very exciting. Um, and then I'll just add really quick, because I know we're getting short on time, but um, one other really exciting development is there was a position in um, open space in mountain parks, a um, soil, sorry, a soil health coordinator, mm -hmm. and that position was just made permanent. So that's really exciting that we are now establishing a baseline of soil carbon data on our own lands in the city um, to really further this work. So a lot is happening and honestly, a lot more is going to happen in the future um, in this topic. So I would just encourage folks to stay tuned. Um, and if you want to participate, you know, there's lots of things folks can do. We all, a lot of us, not all of course, a lot of us have access to a little bit of land mm -hmm. in this county, in this beautiful state that we can um, help out with this very cool solution. So that's just a yeah. taste, a yeah. taste of what's going on. <laughs> I just Thanks, met Jamie. that new person. Okay. I just yeah. I thought she was amazing. I mean, yeah. I went out, we met some ranchers, we met some farmers, we went out to see some of that great, amazing work. To me, it blew my mind because again, soil wasn't where I came from. And when I read your essay, it took me a little bit to community, um, indigenous sort of thought and um sort of taking mm. advantage of community leaders who are there and who can reach out and who can do more. To me, it was those those magical microbes, right? That were already there that we didn't need to invent, that we didn't need to bring consultants in that had such great um, insight into it. But I gotta tell you that going out and really seeing what the city is doing with soil health and the assessment and really being thoughtful about crop rotation and what to till and what not to till and really looking at if what we're doing is bringing water into um, the soil in ways that we want it to stay and be retained. It was out of this world exciting to see 
um, happening and to have so many people, so many farmers bought into it, so many ranchers that are like, we want to help you study it and we want to help do other kinds of regenerative um, farming that is very different. It was it was a revelation, Jane. Hey, man, once you uh, fall in love with soil, <laughs> it's forever. <laughs> Take my word for it. It's, it I stays it. with you. Um, but just I'm, to wrap I'm, up a little. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jamie. No, I just wanted if we could had to, if we do have time to get your quick thoughts on like where we go from here like if if dr zelikova was in charge of like what's next in the city of Boulder with soil health what would you want um, us to be doing i mean these days one of the biggest things i'm excited to do is like really think carefully about what we need to do to help farmers and ranchers change the way that they manage their soils and realizing it's a really difficult question um and the things that we might do to incentivize a farmer to change to a new way of managing their land is different than to a different farmer who is already doing those things on mm. her property and what do we need to sort of do to continue that and the incentives we create which is all really about policy really have to be tailored to address the different issues and then the other big thing is i see a large kind of rising and proliferation of carbon markets which um is alarming to me because it is not coupled with what I find to be important, which is rigorous measurement. Mm -hmm. And at least for me thinking about soil carbon, I know soils are really tricksy as I call them. You can walk 10 meters or 10 feet on, on the metric system. You can walk 10 feet <laughs> and be, you know, and have yeah. a really different kind of soil with a different mm. capacity to sequester carbon, which mm. makes measurement really important. So the biggest thing that I'm excited about is that Boulder County is doing so much in measurement mm -hmm. and sort of verifying that the practices that are implemented are having the desired outcomes um, and that we're not just kind of taking it on faith. Um, so awesome. those are kind of the biggest things is thinking really carefully through the incentives and then thinking uh, a lot about how we need to measure um, the outcomes and match them to the incentives in the best possible way. Awesome. Yeah. I will take so that just, forward. Um, to wrap up, sorry, because uh, we're running a little bit low on time. I wanted to wrap up really with this idea of community. And one, the last chapter in the book before it wraps up is um, about Puerto Rico and the impacts of the hurricanes. Um, and, and it's called uh, Community is Our Best Chance. And the author really like kind of talks about her own personal experience when she was in Puerto Rico after the hurricane and a community coming together to sort of do mutual aid to help uh, people make sure they get water, food, etc. And so she writes, the future will be challenging. All around us, the sea level will rise and people will be displaced. When disasters happen, the person right in front of you is your best chance at survival. That's when we understood. The times we will be facing are going to require us to recognize that the most important thing around us is community. So I kind of wanted to wrap with that because um, we have this opportunity to talk about Boulder and the greater kind of Boulder County and surrounding area community and how we can come together to help figure out the best way forward for climate, um, that the solutions that really work for us and work for everyone in our communities. Um, and so, to go back to Marianne S. Hegler, who I super love, she writes, we can be messy, imperfect, contradictory, broken. We can learn the difference between hopelessness and helplessness, as Jamie was saying. What if we've been doing the equation backward? What if hope isn't what leads to action? What if courage leads to action and hope is what comes next? And I wanna close with um, a little kind of tiny, I don't know if it's a poem or just a saying, uh, but it's from R.O. Kwan, and it's on page 165 if you're following along. I want to live on a planet that can hold us. I believe we can still help it, us, do so. If nothing else, why not try? Why not hope and then act as if? This is our one wild, long, lone home. What other choice do we have? And so this is kind of an invitation for us, the community, really be bold and ambitious about how we think about climate change and to come together as a community to do that uh, together. Um, and I'll kind of stop there and invite Julian back to maybe field some questions from the audience, if that's okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right, awesome. 
Well, thank you for holding that conversation with us. It felt very personal. It felt very local. And I really appreciate y'all being here tonight and sharing all of that with us. Um, we did have a couple of questions. And one of them is, uh, what was the most recent local piece of climate communication you read that could have been today or saw, <laughs> or maybe you heard someone over at a coffee shop? And uh, based on what you, based on that, what emotions do you think are most critical for climate leadership? So I'll say that's unfair, right, to me, because I read tons of stuff that staff gives me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a one on one with Dan Burke today, who is our director of open space and mountains parks and talked to him. And yesterday I was talking to Jonathan Cohn, who's our director of, of climate initiatives. Right. So I, I see a lot of it um, all the time. But I, I will say that the things that to me are most critical are people, uh, our leaders speaking up and recognizing where the gaps are so that they can go fix it. The courage of our leadership, they have great technical skills, are moving us forward in amazing directions. And yet still what I hear is we need more voices in this room. We need low income voices. We need people of color. We need people who are cost burden and we need to invite that into our spheres and that to me, not only does it touch my sort of social justice heart, but it really lends hope to me about how the more voices are represented in this, the better off our policies will be, the better off our solutions together jointly will be. And the fact that our leaders are willing to stand up and say, we haven't gone far enough, we haven't from, heard from enough people, to me is just um, is, is exciting to hear um because the outcomes are going to be so much rich, richer as they continue to push that message through yes i i think it is a hard question because i also read so many things in a day probably an email into my <laughs> council email asking about i think we had one today about um rtd and climate and you know something really local like that but um i think as far as emotions I feel are most critical, I really just come back to empathy. I feel like putting myself in the shoes of, of so many different types of people in different places in life and, and trying to relate to them as I do this work is one of the most critical things any policymaker I think could put themselves in. Um, and then just, yeah, that courage that we've been talking about all evening, but I guess that's not really emotion. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, there's, there is a ton of really great local climate communication out there. Um, I'm a big advocate of Colorado Public Radio, so I listen to their climate beat all the time. So um, I would encourage folks to um, pay attention to them and all of our local journalists that are doing such a great job of covering the impacts locally and the solutions that we're trying to work on as a whole state. There's so many opportunities to get involved. Yeah, I think uh, the rock I've been living under makes all my climate communication very science-y. <laughs> science um, and I've been reading a lot of papers about climate this week. So um, but I think in terms of emotion, I love empathy. That's like so important. The other one I would say is it's okay to feel grief. I keep coming back. I know it's like a big word, but I think I, I want it to be okay for that mm -hmm. to be something that we feel about what's happening because it is really upsetting. And I want to acknowledge that that's okay. I just don't, what I don't want is for that grief to become paralyzing. And so I, I want to acknowledge like this week and the la last week were really hard in terms of climate for me. And I felt a lot of grief and I want to be able to say that. Um, and I didn't let it paralyze me. Uh, I kind of try to use it as fuel to keep going and to get more ambitious, so. Thank you. Uh, we did have a comment. This is this is not really a question, but we did feel obliged to share it because it's very <laughs> sweet. Um, so yeah, <laughs> MXGDL on YouTube says, Dr. Zalakova, you coached my high school Frisbee team, H-U-L-A. Awesome. This is Max, and I'm working at UCAR now. I'm so proud yeah. of you. I'm so glad you're Love doing this, this important work. <laughs> oh, my God. Awesome. Um, can I just say that's awesome? <laughs> Hi, Max. It's so nice to see you. Um, I coached the Boulder High School team for like four or five years when I was in grad school, and I lived a block away from the high school. And it was super, super amazing. And I've run into people that I coached 
like all over the world just randomly. <laughs> and I'm so like I'm so excited and honored that I got to do that. I mean, grad school. If if there was ever a time where where you're like more in control of your schedule, it's grad school. So, <laughs> That's um, and then That's you true. can show up at a high school from three to thirty to five and coach every day. It was really amazing. Uh, I wonder if Max Love is that. working on climate. I'll follow up. Nice to see you. <laughs> Love it. And um, the last thing that we wanted to ask you, and this is just so we can end on a positive note and just share this with ourselves and everybody in the audience. Various contributors in the selection from All We Can Save call us to mm -hmm. fall in love with the earth. So I was just wondering if each of you could share a way that you rejoice in the beauty of the planet. Oh, that is um, such a great question. Is, I don't know if there's one it. way, right? I mean, the, I'll say like the thing that I do every day uh, that is very like very local, literally local to my backyard is I go visit all the plants and I water them and I like take mm -hmm. care of them. And um, we have a garden and I take care of the garden. I, it's such a nerdy, weird way, but it's, I can't always go for a big hike, even though I do most days. And that's a really good way to rejoice and reconnect. But I also think like a little patch of grass or like if I plant something and then I literally go stare at the dirt every day until I see a little green leaf start to poke out and grow. And I check on it every day and celebrate every little piece of growth, every new leaf. Um, and I think that more than anything just kind of reconnects me to the things I care about. I, yeah, as you can see, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Jimmy. Oh, yes, I'll let you close this out. Um, I just, I think this is such an important question because I think um, you were mentioning grief and that is such a real thing. I mean, I think, um, you know, all of my coworkers struggle with this in very real ways and we share resources with each other, how to work through it. Um, and it really, you do have to actively cultivate that joy and put it in your life very deliberately. Um, I think to do this work day in and day out. And I, I just love that question so much. And for me, it's really simple. I think, of course, I love to travel and I love to see this planet, but I'm just so connected to trees and, and they're, they're just so magical when you read about mm -hmm. how they interact with each other. And um, I'm just so moved by the system that they and how resilient they are. And so, yeah, I will just find a, a giant tree. We have some beautiful ones out here where I live and plop down and do some reading um, right below one. And that just really centers me and just makes me really in awe of what we're trying to save, all that we can save here. Yeah. So I would encourage folks to do that, especially on the hard days. Oh, we should have ended with all we can save reference, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, That's okay. Yeah, I, I will say you'll see, um, I've got some plants in the house and I live in an apartment, so I don't have that patch of grass anymore, but I surround myself when I can with that. And so I spend some time with each of the plants and um, just just take that downtime. And where I don't, you don't have the benefit of seeing that where I am, but I love art and um, I am, I, I love trees as well. It's, it's uh, they're amazing um, in all its forms. And so there are different places in my um, apartment that I surround myself with nature because I mm. find it humbling and, um, just a beautiful, it brings me a sense of joy. And then I'll say, I moved here, right? I, I moved to Boulder. What brought me here is our, you know, these majestic mountains and the environment and the love for the environment, the stewardship this community has. So I happen to enjoy a very noisy road, but on the other side of that noisy road, I get to see these beautiful mountains every morning as I come out. And I have taken to uh, doing a little meditation every morning and just appreciating um, both nature and a city that really protects it um, and moves forward and pushes itself to do all that it can to save the planet. Love that. Thanks for sharing, guys. We are out of time. Um, so on behalf of the Boulder Library and the Boulder Library Foundation. I want to thank you, Dr. Zelikova, Nuria, and Jamie for holding this conversation here with us tonight. 
Uh, I also want to thank my colleague, Terza, working behind the scenes, moderating and engaging with the chat. And viewers, I also want to thank you. Let's keep the conversation going. Uh, we have an event this Saturday, uh, September 25th at 4.30. It's our annual Teen Summit. Uh, our keynote speaker is going to be All We Can Save contributor and youth climate activist, Alexandria Villasenor. Uh, adults are welcome to come to this event. It's teen led, so the panel will be made up of teens. We hope you'll be able to join us. And you can learn more at boulderlibrary.org slash one dash book. I hope everyone has a great night and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks.